All right, thank you everybody for joining us today for our Monday Zoom and Learn. My name is Tommy Dutch. I'm the area sales manager for California Title. My co-host, Mary Jane Morris, uh, with these trainings will not be able to join us today as she's uh, uh, busy giving some VIP service and, um, and such. So um, it'll just be myself and Steve. This is week three of seller financing. Um, you know, we've covered uh, lease options, uh, in week one, uh, we also um, uh, covered some alternative seller financing, but today we will be going over AITDs, also known as RAPs, um, and I believe subject subject twos, right? We, we hit on that briefly, and I'm not certain, Steve, if that's part of your uh, presentation today or not, but, um, you know, Steve's been doing this for many years, and he's been kind enough to join us on, on our Zoom and Learns to drop his extraordinary amount of knowledge pertaining to uh, seller financing. And um, so without further ado, I'm not going to take anything from Steve. Steve, if you could briefly uh, introduce yourself to the group in case there's somebody on that missed you the first two weeks. Guys, keep in mind, we recorded all of these and uh, I will put in the chat where you can find those on YouTube. So please uh, go there and watch week one and week two as well. But um, Steve, take it away. All right, everybody can see my screen okay? Yes. All right, so uh, welcome. Uh, my name is Steve Gronlin, vintage mortgage firm, president, uh, uh, broker owner. I've been in the business 31 years. I've done over 6,000 mortgage loans myself. And one of the things that I do to build my business is I, in order to build relationships, I do workshops and seminars for um, board of real estate offices throughout Southern California and Central and even Northern California. And I've seen these other workshops. Of course, this, uh, this I'm just doing a very small segment of the alternative purchase options workshop today, just a small segment of it. It's all going to be available. I'm, I told, uh, I told the, ho the host, the gracious host today that, uh, um, I would make this workshop available to all of you for free. All you got to do is go to my YouTube channel and, and uh, subscribe to it. And you'll be able to look up all kinds of different subjects and find any subject you want. And, and you'll get a narrative or an explanation in the way you need it to be uh, explained um, for that particular subject. But there's other things that I, I do mentally muscling the mortgage mess, which I do for real estate broker offices all the time. Um, and that's basically everything real estate agents need to know about the mortgage industry to sound like an expert, but not necessarily cloud their minds with mortgage stuff. <laughs> also, building a lead generating machine, helping agents go from zero to 10 or from 10 to 20 or from 30 to 40 deals a year um, or more. Um, just getting getting the process of building the lead generating machine and your marketing in play probably should probably should silence my phone. Anyways, um, let's just talk about this. Does anybody have any questions right now? I don't see anything in the chat as of yet, so we're good to go. All right. So is it possible to be in bankruptcy in a foreclosure, owe the federal government $100,000, and recently lost a court case where the plaintiff won a $100,000 judgment against you and be working with a professional real estate agent to buy a home. Of course, ordinarily you would think no. Is it possible to sell a home that's underwater? Sell a home for more than what it's worth without the buyer paying too much for the house? Or sell a home while helping the buyer obtain a loan with a rate two points lower than the current rates without buying down the rate. I love teaching about all-inclusive trust deeds because it is so, there's so many opportunities. As a real estate investor, and I am, I think anybody in real estate should be some kind of a real estate investor if you believe in what you do. Um, I bought and sold a lot of properties. Uh, I never sell them myself. I always use real estate agents that work with me as, as my agent. Um, but nevertheless, I'm going to teach you how to sell a home with financing and without a mortgage loan. And of course, the question is, why the heck would a mortgage guy do that? It's just to build relationships. 
Zig Ziglar said it best. You can have anything in the world you want if you're able to help enough people get what they want. So here are the statistics. Now, the statistics have changed a little bit, but we're going to talk about a hidden market here that most people don't know about. And this is this is massive. If you can really get your arms around this, and very few real estate agents really do. I mean, I'm talking very few. One or two out of 100 will ever get the under full understanding of alternative purchase options so that they can really become deal engineers. Um, so here are the st statistics. They're a little off now, but here's what they were not too long ago. Buyers who want to buy have a down payment and have the capacity to buy a house. Only 15% of those people qualify for a loan. There's a lot of people that have the want to buy, have a down payment, have the capacity, but don't qualify for a loan. Sellers, here's their hidden market. Sellers who want to sell. 10% own their house free and clear. It's always been true. 40% have equity. Probably a little more than that. 45% are between 90 and 105% upside down. You might change that for so between uh, 90 and uh, I'm sorry, but, but between 80 and 105% upside down, meaning they're not going to get a lot of money when they sell it because they don't have a lot of equity in it to do so. And then 5% uh, are completely underwater. That's probably still true today. So in the buyer's world, we're working with 15%. And what, what this understanding these options will do for you is it'll open up the whole pie and find that hidden market of, of buyers and sellers. Because uh, we're working right now with just 40% on sellers, where we're going to open that up to uh, a 90% of the sellers out there who really would like to sell their property. Um, if you remember, well, nobody here remembers. Has anybody been in the, was in the mortgage or real estate business during Jimmy Carter administration? I don't think so, because you'd be about 70 years old now. Anybody out there that <laughs> was there? <laughs> Anyways, Jimmy Carter, uh, interest rates went up to 18, 19, 20% interest. And nobody, even if they qualified for the loan, wanted to get their own loan. So that's when alternative purchase options came into play. In fact, the lease option and the all-inclusive trust deed uh, were perfected and put on the car forms in 1991, just as they were no longer needed. <laughs> Isn't that normal for car to be that far behind? As soon as they finally get everything on the forms and perfect them, make sure they're safe for buyers and sellers. As soon as they got them on the car forms, they were no longer needed. And they have not been needed since then until now. And I've always known this was going to happen because rates went down for so many, so many years. And uh, that's why I produced this alternative purchase option workshop. Uh, workshop had it reviewed by John Giardinelli of the Giardinelli Law Firm. And I've taught it many, many times throughout the years. And uh, I intended to, to teach it to more people. Um, but, you know, because rates stayed low for a long time, it really didn't, it really wasn't in its prime yet. Of course, nothing has changed. So now it's going to be in its prime even more and more as rates go up. And if they go up and come down and go up and come down, it's okay. We need to learn this for the times when it's going to make sense. When there's an underlying loan on a property at three and a half percent, it makes sense almost all the time. Um, they were perfected by the use of escrow, title insurance recordation of all the documentation and third-party trustee services. Talk about those a little bit as we go. All-inclusive trustee, you, you call it, some people call it a wraparound loan. It's the same thing. Wraparound loan and all-inclusive trustee. Another name for it is seller financing. All of these options, AITDs, wraparound or AITDs, lease options, land contracts, they're all a form of seller financing or subject to, which is another word for seller financing. Subject to can be a land contract, uh, AITD, or a lease option. Uh, but a subject to is more directly related to all inclusive trustees. Now, last week we talked about, or two weeks ago, we talked about the lease option. So if you weren't on this event during the lease option, I would recommend you go to my uh, YouTube, that's Vintage Mortgage Firm forward slash the One Bite at a Time show. Subscribe and then just look up, uh, search the word lease, and then watch that portion of the lease option. 
Because if you understand the lease option, it's a lot easier to understand the all-inclusive trustee. So let's go on. Now, this is important that if you have a question, um, raise your hand. And if you could let me know, somebody raise their hand, they have a question. This, this isn't gonna be a long workshop, but I wanna make sure that this particular portion doesn't go beyond where somebody understands it, okay? And I'll watch the chat as well. So feel free to put questions in the chat and I'll, I'll stop Steve and ask yeah. those questions so we can get them answered. Thank you, because I can't see them. Yep. All right, so this is really important to understand on the all-inclusive trust deed. And again, if you don't understand the land, uh, the, uh, the lease, uh, the, uh, the uh, lease option, check that out too, but you'll remember this. And this workshop's available for, for free. So you can go back to this and forward to the sections you want. We also have land contracts in it today as well. So anyways, it's one single closing. The all-inclusive trust deed is one single closing. Buyer subject to the existing financing or buying subject to the existing financing. Seller financing, no bank needed. Title changes hands. It results in a default in most institutional loans. Just understand that. And we'll get to that in a minute. Of course, <laughs> I used to say my workshop, oh no, because this is always the thing that attorneys bring up and it's always false. For example, and I'm going to use low numbers. Uh, a seller is is selling his property for hundred thousand dollars. The seller owns fifty owes fifty thousand dollars on a pre-existing loan uh, or trust deed with an interest rate of seven percent and two hundred and forty months or twenty years remaining on the term of the loan. The buyer is able to put twenty thousand dollars down payment on the purchase of the property. An all-inclusive trust deed may be formed for $80,000 in favor of the seller with the interest rate at 8% with a 300-month or 25-year loan. Understand, you can't wrap something larger with something smaller. So you have to have something larger to wrap something smaller. Not, not, not always, when you look at the terms, it can be a little bit uh, misunderstanding when I say that, but the, the, the term has to make sense. And, and when you do one of these things, as long as you understand what you're doing, more, the more you do it, the more you'll understand what you're doing. And title, because they're going to ensure this, title won't let you do a contract that isn't going to make sense. For example, title won't let you uh, have a contract that require, that will, that will allow the the, the seller's loan to be paid off before the underlying loan is paid off or wouldn't work. I think it'll make more sense as we go along. So in other words, the, the, the new all-inclusive trust deed is wrapping around the pre-existing loan of 50,000. The seller will earn 1% on his remaining balance at 8%. In other words, the seller's paying 7% on 50,000. He's gonna get 1% more because he's charging 8% on, on that 50,000. And he's gonna get the full 8% on the new balance of 30,000, managing to increase his yield. So now he's making money through uh, a, a higher return on investment. At this point, the buyer of the property will make his or her loan payments to the seller based upon the new loan balance of 80,000. They don't care about the underlying loan. They're making their payments to the seller based upon the seller's loan of 80,000 that was given to them. And the seller continues to make the payments that he or she has already been paying off from the original remaining trust deed for that property. So it's important to understand though, when the buyer's loan is paid off, the seller's loan will have already been paid off years or months, or at least at the very same time as the buyer's loan is paid off. Now, this can be a little confusing until you get a hold of it. The original mortgage company is in first position for the seller. There is no second mortgage here, though. The seller's new lien that he gave 
to the buyer is in first position for the buyer. It's really important to let that sink in for a minute. The original mortgage company is still active. That loan is still in the, in the on the books. It's still recorded. That's in first position for the seller's transaction. That the, the, that's the relationship between that seller and that lender. The seller's new lien is in first position for the relationship between the buyer and the seller. Now, if the buyer defaults, the seller can foreclose. That's the only drawback of a all-inclusive trust deed versus a le uh, lease option is the seller would now have to foreclose and get title back, whereas the lease option seller doesn't lose title, although there's lots of benefits here coming up. If the seller defaults, however, the original lender can foreclose. You understand you have two lenders, either one of them can foreclose. Now, And we and I know your question's already coming up. What if the seller doesn't make his payments and I'm making the payments to the seller? So that's where the third party trustees come in and escrow and title come in. Well, let's go through the numbers. Uh, the existing trans, trust deed loan with the institutional mortgage lender is $50,000, 7%, 20 years left. The new AITD, all-inclusive trust deed, is $80,000 at 8% with 21 years left. This is another, this is slightly different than the example, but almost the same thing. Or, or, so that's one way to do it. Or you could mirror image the first. In other words, the new AITD will be exactly what's left on the existing a, trans, uh, trustee. So in other words, the new first mortgage lien that the seller is giving the buyer is 50,000, 7% with 20 years left. And then the seller is going to provide a second trust deed for the rest. Maybe that's ten thousand. He's going to he's going to offer prime plus three, uh, maybe mimicking a second or whatever he wants to do. You know, or and maybe he's going to do interest only for one hundred and eight months. And the reason that is is because when this gets paid off, the other loans all have to be paid off too. The new. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. Let's say, I'm sorry, go back. I apologize. The existing trustee. So in other words, if the seller has a first and a second, the existing trustee is there and the new trustee or all-inclusive trustee is wrapping that other second. Does that make sense? All right. So you can actually wrap that $10,000 $10, or $40,000 with prime plus four and fully amortized in 109 months. Does that make sense? Yeah. I hope, hope I didn't mess that up. Yeah. Anyways, no. uh, also always remember with an al alternative purchase option that a confused mind always says no. So AITDs have more moving parts. So if you're not good at explaining this, the seller or the buyer is going to sound be confused. And when they're confused, you've got a problem. So the better you are at explaining this and the more at ease you can help people feel, the the more often you're going to get this to go through. And that takes time. Um, I hope you have success in the first two or three you try, because that'll give you a, a reason to be excited about continuing to learn more about them. Otherwise, you're just going to get this bad attitude about alternative purchase options. And you're going to let the 1% of real estate agents out there murder you with their, their knowledge and success. Right. So, and before you go further, Steve, on that uh, uh, last two pages back when it said, you know, buyer, if the, if the, if the buyer or if, yeah, if the buyer uh, does not make the payments then the seller can foreclose on them and try and take title back. But let's reiterate that if the, if the seller, if the buyer's making the payments and the seller's not making the payments to the first trust deed and the original lender forecloses on the, on the home, that loan's in first position, right? So they foreclose on it um, and uh, they wanna get paid out on it. They could go through the foreclosure process. The first trust deed would get paid first, but the second trust deed would still be in play from the seller right. or from the buyer. Well, kind of, there's two first, they're, they're both in first position based upon the relationship, but, but, you, but you get the idea. The important thing is, you don't ever want that to happen if you're worried about, you know, some people will just trust the seller to do what they're supposed to do. Sometimes people have that kind of relationship. Otherwise, you simply use a third party trustee 
and uh, and 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 Mary Jane would, I'm sure, can maybe even do that for for folks. I, I think that might be a service she provides. But a third third party trustee normally costs maybe I don't know 25 bucks a, a month to accept the payment from the buyer, and then they pay the underlying loans before they send any money to the seller, so that there's mm -hmm. no chance right. that that seller isn't paying their loan. And same thing with taxes and insurance. You can take that impound. You can create an impound with a uh, third-party trustee where that third-party trustee is going to pay the taxes and the insurance so that there's no chance those don't get paid. Does right. that make so sense? It's, sense? A, it's a third-party third um, um, escrow impound, basically, that makes those payments for them. And yes, I believe Mary Jane's company uh, does perform those and does have the capability of, of doing those impound accounts. Absolutely. And that's a unique capability. It's going to become more and more popular as time goes on. Yeah. So everybody understand this example where you can, do, you can wrap one single loan, but you could also wrap two loans. Mm -hmm. And sometimes when you wrap two loans, it's better to mirror image the first one. Again, less moving parts, and then make the, the higher, larger all-inclusive trust deed where the buyer, the seller is making some money or profit here, put that on the second. But you don't have to do that. You could have two AITDs here that are that are larger than the first two AITDs. Right. Okay. So let's uh, benefits to the buyer. Let's really understand these before we get to the elephant in the room. Benefits to the buyer. We could could be lower down payment than a purchase. Could be how much down payment is required enough to pay the commissions. In my opinion. Jumbo, no problem. There's no different programs for jumbo deals. Bad credit, but has the capacity. Title transfers in a single closing. In, uh, interest is secure. Interest in the property is, is, is secured. Can buy in an entity. Name's not on title. If you're going through divorce or lawsuit, of course, you're responsible for, for telling the truth to the court and, and everybody. But you know, as far as you can, you can buy in an entity, you can put it in your corporate name where you can't do that with a regular loan because institutional lenders don't lend to entities, they lend to people. And you can put it into an entity after you buy it, but there's still going to be a paper trail there. In an AITD like this, uh, there, there could be no paper trail. Security through obscurity, I call it. Um, can obtain title insurance and escrow. Now you don't have to, but if you're representing other people, I highly suggest you're always going to use title insurance and escrow. Now, if you're a, a real estate investor and you choose not to, for whatever reason, and you know what you're doing, I've done that before, or based upon the person you're dealing with, that's something different. Um, but you're representing other people, you should always use title insurance and use escrow. Tax deductions uh, from interest and depreciation huge savings um huge savings if you understand how the pro how to profit from the banking industry's biggest se secret which is amortization we can go through that in another conversation but very exciting benefit to the sellers still uh sell a house for higher sales price solve an underwriter home uh, underwater home problem uh save uh credit rating Maybe they're not going to lose their house or they're not going to fall behind. No landlord-tenant relationship. In other words, the buyer is making all the repairs and responsible for all the repairs. Their down payment is a down payment, not necessarily a deposit, although do what your broker tells you to do. Uh, no landlord, sudden expenses. Uh, you can sell the loan. You know, this is pretty kind of cool. If you've got an underlying loan and you're allowing somebody else to ex to take over your loan through an all-inclusive trustee, you, that loan has value. So if somebody were to buy a home today at 7% versus take over the loan that's on the house for 3.5% with the remaining loan payments, I mean, with today's prices in California, that could be a savings of a half a million dollars to the buyer over the life of the loan. I mean, that could be huge. So what could you sell that loan for? I mean, if you if you gave me an opportunity to buy the loan and I wanted your house and it was going to save me a half million dollars, how much would I pay you for that right to buy your loan? Well, I'd pay you something. It'd be worth it. Would I give you twenty five thousand or fifty thousand more for the house for that right? It could be that could be huge. People would did this all the time in 
in the Jimmy Carter years. You can, it's just like selling a house with a Corvette in a garage. Of course, an institutional lender won't let you do that. Uh, but you can sell the you can sell the Corvette in the garage with the house in one one transaction. Can change uh, can charge a premium margin over the underlying loan. Easier to qualify for new loans. So in other words, if I'm a seller and I sell a house on an all inclusive trust deed and transferred title, but the loan is still on my credit report, it's going to be a lot easier for me to qualify because I don't have to have evidence twelve months evidence of some rent payment coming in. Um, I don't have to take a 75% of the, the uh, rent as my income to offset the payments. I, it, underwriters just simply won't even look at it. It's not something they even consider part of your debt ratio uh, in most circumstances, except for early on in that transaction. Faster closings, close in 10 days or as fast as it takes. Now, here you go, have a little bit of a challenge. Sometimes people feel pushed. So you'll find out, as I found out in these transactions, sometimes it's still a better idea to put that closing out to 20 or 30 days so that people don't feel pushed when they're already maybe a little confused. Make it a 20 or 30 day closing. Give it, give everybody the time for the due diligence and then nobody can nobody's going to feel like they're being pushed off. Possible future asset um, or profit, of course. Benefits to the agents. Faster closings, no mortgage, <laughs> no mortgage, no appraisal necessary, no sudden surprises with lenders. Can I hear an amen? Amen. Programs do not change overnight. More buyers and more sellers, more opportunity, more closings, easier closings, full commissions, all full commissions. Now, your choice here on the full commissions, I mean, if you decided to uh, help somebody with an all-inclusive trust deed and a down payment was only going to be 10000 I mean, you could either choose if it's okay with your broker to, to uh, you know, get paid a little bit now and a little bit later when they exercise their option or a little bit now and a little bit on a monthly basis or nothing now and something later when they close. But, you know, you, you took all your risks. You've done all the work up front. So I wouldn't even, it's my own personal opinion, I wouldn't even take on a buyer uh, or a seller in an AITD unless I knew that uh, we're, we're not going to take any deals where there isn't going to be enough down payment. Um, in order to pay all the commissions up front. Um, more closings, easier closings, full commissions, can get paid up front, partial or cl at close, can get paid monthly too, way more options for you to deal with. Does anybody have any questions on that? Because that can be a little confusing. I'm doing so good that nobody has any questions or they've all hung up. What's the, def what's the deal? No, the, there was a couple questions uh, in the chat, but I believe you've answered them um, for the most part. Um, there was one that said, so if the seller doesn't pay his loan and the first foreclosed on, does uh, that allow the seller to foreclose his buyer, even though he's at fault for the foreclosure? No, but the, no, because if you use a third party transaction or uh, tr uh, trustee with a escrow company, you wouldn't let that happen. But even if you didn't use that and that was going to happen, you you would still have some legal protections there. The key is you need to find out about the foreclosure before it actually really foreclosed. Right. Um, and there's some legal protections. Your attorney can get involved in, and there can be some negotiation, ba negotiation back and forth. It could end up to be a, a short sale where you end up with a better deal because you have a contract with the, with the owner. It might be that you're going to catch up the loan, uh, but by doing that, then you're going to get a whole new deal. So you're going to negotiate that because the seller is going to lose the house no matter what. Now they don't really care how much they get because they're going to lose everything. Um, so maybe there's going to be a negotiated short sale. It might be even better for the buyer than it was. But yeah, those opportunities are always there. I'm always looking. You know, if somebody was is in is in foreclosure, then that's an opportunity to get a, get a house for a little bit better price. They're going to lose it anyways. Mm -hmm. And sometimes people are facing a short sale, and they don't want to lose their credit. And I can come in with enough money to cover. Uh, their arrearages, bring it current for them, and then stays current after that, after the purchase as, as a buyer, I'll make sure it stays current after that. And then it looks like they got behind, they got current, now they're still a homeowner, according to the credit report anyways, the credit would be a much, much better. And then when they go to buy a house, they don't have to worry about the fact that they had a foreclosure or anything like that. Does that make right. sense? Correct. 
Yeah, and I, and I think, you know, uh, going into it is it does make sense to see if you can find uh, an escrow that will allow an impound and make those payments so that, you know, the buyer coming in makes the payments to escrow and escrow pays the existing first mortgage and then sends a check every month for the difference to the to the seller. You know, right. and, and then you're and protected. I've seen that. And I've seen that done two different ways. Sometimes the first already has an impound account and they negotiate just to keep that going. And the first keeps paying it. And sometimes the seller will cancel their escrow, escrow account if they can, if it's not a government loan. And then the new escrow company with a third party trustee creates a new impound account and they pay the taxes and insurance uh, with the income that's coming through. But yes, I've seen it. I've seen it happen both ways. And it right. certainly can be very, very safe. And the other question that was in there was, you know, uh, talking about the interest rates, are these norm? I mean, I did answer it back is the interest rates on these, on, on the wraparounds or what have you are negotiable. However, typically you're going to find that they are slightly more than what the current first loan on the property is, right? So it gives a benefit to the seller of, of doing this type of transaction is they're going to make a little bit more off the interest from that, from that buyer coming in. Right. However, Absolutely. if you're talking a three and a half percent loan and you're offering four and a half or five percent versus, say, offering eight. Right. You got to be able to negotiate that in the deal. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And that makes a deal great for a seller. Many times the seller will, will do the deal when they realize, A, they're not going to have a huge tax burden that year uh, and, and B, they're going to make some extra money. Now I found it people do it that way where they just wrap a, a smaller loan with a bigger loan and the and the seller is making money every month. And some people will mirror image that underlying loan. And I like the term mirror imaging because when I said when I said, and I've done a lot of these before, so I kind of know the the uh, questions and the concerns people have, both buyers and sellers. And so when you mirror image the ex existing first, in other words, if there's if there's 20 years left on a four and a half percent interest rate loan and and uh you know they're going to keep they're going to make exactly the same payments to the house uh, to the seller uh as what's on the underlying loan but yeah. so then you can calculate how much interest you're going to save by not getting a seven percent interest rate loan today and you're you're using a four percent loan but then that might mean Okay, but I'm going to instead of selling the house for seven hundred and twenty thousand, I'm going to sell the house for seven hundred and sixty thousand, and you're still saving. Let's say you can show the buyer he's saving a hundred and ten thousand uh, dollars in interest because he's taking an underlying loan of four percent, but he's paying thirty or forty thousand more for the house, mm -hmm. and I, the seller gets the deal that way. Right. So either way, it can be done. Whatever it takes to make both parties feel comfortable. Again, you're never deceiving anyone. You're, you're solving their problems and explaining what is available to mitigate their risk. I mean, there's always risk. People say, well, that sounds risky. I just read about it, buy a house on a regular mortgage. You don't think that's risky? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> have you ever, have you ever read one of those contracts? <laughs> anyway, any questions? And, and keep in mind on, on top of that is, um, you know, for a buyer, again, these make total sense for a buyer that doesn't have 10% or 20% to put down, right? And they may be able to, to do a deal where they're paying a little bit more, but they're putting a little less down and they may get better terms than what they could potentially get. So again, it has to make sense for both parties. Yeah. And, but, you know, but, it also comes down to, is it going to be your primary or is it going to be a rental as well, right? A lot of times it comes down to is just what the monthly is, not so much how much you're paying for it, but what's your monthly outgoing, right? So if it's going to be your primary, does it fit within your budget if you get a lower interest, but you pay a little bit more for the house? And right. on the flip side, if it's a rental, is are you still cash flowing? It doesn't matter what the price is. All that matters, you're still cash flowing every month. Right. And yeah, you guys all know that terminology. Um, uh, but I also want to make it uh, make it clear, though, um, this is not just for people who can't qualify for a loan. I would much rather buy a house this way, even though I can qualify for a loan. I don't have another loan on my credit. Uh, I'm I, right now. I'd be definitely getting uh, buying a house today with a four percent interest rate. Underlying interest rate is going to be far better than me buying that house as an investment property with a seven and a half percent interest rate. I'd much rather do this. Yeah. And I'd pay that. 
seller a little extra money to do that. Hundred uh, percent. And it would make sense for me to do it, and they should make money. They'll make money too. Okay. So I'm not going to go through all of this. Um, I will say that uh, it, you know there, there's so many different ways to go through this and explain this. And you'll be able to go back and watch this video because I have it all recorded for you. It's even more concise. It's more, it's easier to understand because I, you know, back when I recorded it, I'd been doing it every other week. So I was a lot better doing it. I haven't actually done this workshop for a while. So anyways, that's just understanding um, a couple of things about this. I want to go right to, well, let, let me show you this real quick. This is an example of an, a new all-inclusive trustee, I'm just going to call it AITD from now on, a new AITD wrapping a smaller tr uh, trust uh, deed of trust. Understand, though, that doesn't necessarily mean the loan balances are the same. Notice that the larger AITD is 480000 but the current balance on the existing trust deed is 500000 and And the current trust deed is a 5%. Uh, interest rate and the new trust deed is 6.125 and there's going to be $30,000 down and so there's going to result in a $450,000 loan balance uh, with 25 years left on this whereas what's left on it right now would be a 25, 25 years left and there's a $500,000 current balance but how do you know if the eight new AITD is larger than the, the current trust deed well look at the payments 292295 for the old one, 293384 for the new one. The old one is going to pay off $876,885 for the, over the life of the loan. The new one's going to pay off $880,152. This would work. However, what would the new AITD have to have to make this work? It would have to have a prepayment penalty. Because the new AITD, three, four years into it, is still going to have a higher balance than the old AIT or the old trustee. So there would have to be a prepayment penalty to the buyer to understand that if you prepay this, you've got to finish paying off the existing underlying trans trustee, even though the new AITD that I as the seller gave you will have a lower balance. I think that makes sense. I'm not going to go through all of these examples, but they're great examples to do. Um, but I do want to go through, um, I want to go to the elephant in the room because that's what everybody wanna, uh -huh. wants to know about. <laughs> Sorry. So the sure. elephant in the room. Um, do on sales clause. Everybody, your attorney, when you take this to your attorney, I promise you the last time attorneys dealt with this was back in the Carter administration, and those attorneys are either dead or retired. So they need to learn just like you need to learn, as a matter of fact. Um, now, you can go to the right attorney, and I can recommend the right one, like the Giardinelli Law Group, to get your information. Um, and then you can research, do some research yourself and help your attorney know where to go to determine whether he thinks it's safe for you to do. But makes sometimes you'll have a seller that goes to their attorney and their attorney doesn't know. So sometimes you need to get on the phone with the attorney and explain explain the program. And, and that does come with some communication skills. Or you can simply give them the video that I put in my uh, YouTube channel that you're welcome to give to them and let them watch it and understand it. Because I, I promise you, there's not a lot of videos like this explaining it. So let's go to the due on sales calls. The transfer the title is transferred and in an institutional loan, it says that if you transfer title without paying off the loan, they can call the new, note due and they can make uh, they can make you uh, sell the house or refinance immediately. And so, uh, and that's the, that's okay. But if you sell your house, you, you're, it's not illegal to do that, to transfer title like this. You're not going to go to prison. It's not immoral. You're not going to go to hell. <laughs> and it's not dangerous. It's not poisonous. You're not going to get sick. Okay, what would happen if the due on sales clause was enforced? Now, we know that government loans have the ability to be assumed, but government loans can use AITDs too, so they're not legally assumed but they're legally wrapped with an all-inclusive trustee still. Uh, so what would happen if a due on sales clause was ever enforced? 
In other words, if somebody, if some lender uh, found out that the house has transferred title and the underlying loan had not been paid off and uh, the taxes are being paid, the insurance is being paid, the house is being upkept, there's nothing else wrong, but the title is transferred. And if the law in any state in the United States were ever to allow that lender to enforce that do on sales clause, then it would not be on your car forms. It would not be insurable by title insurance. And it would not be widely used. And it would not still be legal. So you got to understand that there's never, ever been a situation. Now, I, if your attorney's really good, he'll say, yeah, but what about such and such versus such and such? Yeah, what about such and such versus such and such? And if they're really good, they'll do all kinds of research and they'll come up with the, these case case numbers. But in every single one of those cases, every single one of those cases, there was something else that was in default. T taxes weren't being paid. Insurance weren't being paid. Uh, you know, uh, the mortgage payment wasn't being paid. <laughs> so you can't take one of those examples and say that the judge allowed the lender to exercise and enforced well, except, but enforce their due on sales clause because it has never happened. The soonest it ever does, whenever it happens, anywhere in the country, it'll come off your car forms. It will not be title insured by national title insurance companies. It won't be widely used anymore, and they won't still they won't be legal anymore. So why? Well, who would be harmed? Got to understand why. Who would be harmed with an AITD? Who would be benefit from an AITD? Who doesn't benefit from an AITD? Who would be against them? Why would be, why would uh, who would benefit if they were were outlawed? Who would speak ill of them? Who would design legislation that would confuse people about them? Who controls most of the real estate in the in the country today? Do attorneys understand them? No, <laughs> it's banks. Banks are doing this because. They know that when they would want to enforce their due on sales clauses because their interest rates have gone up and now they've got an underlying loan at three and a half percent and title is transferred. Now, now is when they would want to enforce their due on sales clause and get them to refinance or sell the house so they can get that money back at three and a half percent and re-lend it out at seven percent. Does that make sense? Say, uh-huh. Give me a hand wave. hundred <laughs> percent. <All right. laughs> So now let's go, let's explain what, how this goes. Can I, can I enter into a contract as a lender that includes a baby clause? All right, so let's think about that. So lenders, so if, 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 uh, if it's never been in, allowed to be enforced, can a lender even have something on a contract that has never been allowed to be enforced? Well, of course you can. You can put anything in a contract. So for example, as a lender, could I add to the contract between me and you, you're going to buy the house and I'm going to lend you money on the house. And if you default, I get your firstborn child. <laughs> now, of course, that sounds ridiculous, but I could put that in a contract and it would be legal for me to put it in a contract. But let's just say you lost your job and you were, get, you, you were defaulting and I tried to enforce that clause. Now you could, if you wanted to, we could go through a legal process of me adopting your child, right? Just like if if a lender uh, tried to uh, uh, activate their due on sales clause, you could get scared. You could call your attorney. Your attorney could say, "Well, you're you're in trouble. I don't understand this, so you're probably going to have to sell a refinance." And you could go ahead and refinance it, or you could sell the house and you could get out from underneath any perceived problems. But in the case of a baby clause, would any judge in the country ever allow me to enforce that baby clause just because you defaulted on a contract? And the answer is, of course not. And that's exactly the same thing with a due on sales clause. Now, doesn't mean people don't end up refinancing because they're scared and they get a nasty letter. There is no such thing as a nice, calm letter from a lender that wants th their loan money back at three and a half percent. They send you the scariest letter coming from attorney that can an attorney that possibly can send you. 
and they want you to take it to your attorney and they know your attorney's confused. The last people that dealt with this are dead or retired. So they're gonna have to do some research and they're really, really busy. So it's a lot easier to tell you, just refinance your house. <laughs> but if you were to say, no, I'm not gonna do that. And if they tried to enforce it, they're not gonna because they know they would lose. You just go down and file a small claims action against them or file a court case. It cost, might cost you a couple hundred dollars depending on what, what county you're in and instantly it would disappear. Why? Because they know they would lose. Why would they lose? Because everyone who's ever done that has lost and it never will change until it does. And when it does, then these are gone. Does that make sense? Yep. Um, kind of explain the baby, the baby clause really well. It's legal to do, put the, anything on the contract they want, but you can't necessarily enforce it. You can activate it. Sure. I can send you a nasty letter saying, all right, you defaulted, turn over your baby. <laughs> but it's never going to happen. Um, so here's one of the examples. I took your advice. This is an email from a, a real estate agent, a friend of mine. I took your advice and research the enforceability and dual and sale clause in California. It appears that at one point they were not enforceable, but then it was overturned and changed when the Congress passed the Born St. Germain Act. You will hear that term, which validated all due on sales clause regardless of the contrary state law. California adopted this provision in civil, civil law, da, 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 da. If you look into what that law is, it just says what I just told you. It is legal for the lender to put that clause in the contract. <laughs> in other words, they just made a law that said the same thing that's always been true. The lender can put that law, that, that clause in the contract, but that doesn't change the fact that the lender can't enforce it. Unless mortgage pay payments aren't being made, taxes are being aren't being paid, insurance is being aren't being paid, the house is not being upkept. A lot of people don't know that. If you let your house go, you can actually be foreclosed on because your house is falling apart. But anyways, um, it, unless one of those other things, in which case it wouldn't be, it wouldn't be uh, the note would not be called due because of the due on sales clause. It would be being called due because of one of those other four things. Hope that makes sense. Can a bank convert their due on, uh, activate the due on sales clause? I said they can. What would ha what? Uh, when would they consider doing that? When interest rates go up? Can a bank activate their due on sales clause if there are no other defaults? Sure, they can. Absolutely, yes, they can. But can they enforce it? No. What? Why would a bank even activate them the due on sales clause if they can't enforce it? Because they want their money back at, from at three and a half percent. They want to relend it out at seven. That's what banks do, make money. And if you're in the way of them making money, you're in the way. Uh, can a bank enforce their due on sales clause if there are no other defaults occurring and if borrower does not file a lawsuit? Of course he can enforce it. He can send a letter and he can demand whatever he wants to de demand, but you would need to file a lawsuit. Now, if you did, if it ever went that far, it would be immediately dismissed. But it's not going to, as soon as the bank realizes you're not stupid, then they're just going to back off and move on. Um, it, you know, there was a case, there was a case where the bank would not accept the payments anymore. So the lawsuit was, uh, went through, went forward just long enough to, uh, uh, during, during uh, the time when they had their first hearing and the judge demanded that the, uh, the lender take the payments that were in arrears, don't hit the, the borrower's credit and move on just like normal. Because the first thing that the uh, judge would ask for is, is the, is the payments being made? Well, no. Is that because you didn't take them or is it because they're not being paid or because we didn't take them? Is the taxes and insurance being paid? Yes. Is the house being upkept? Yes. I'm going to, I'm going to terminate this, this lawsuit. Um, if the borrower files a lawsuit and there are no other defaults occurring, What's the likelihood of what's going to happen? <laughs> I always, I always have this look in my eyes. Sometimes I did a, I, I do a, I've done this workshop in front of, you know, Orange County. I did it once in front of a hundred real estate agents. I was so excited about that day. More agents showed up for that one first workshop than ever before. And although it's exciting to have a hundred people in an audience, that also means you have more likely uh, people who just don't 
I don't care what you say. They want to argue with you. So you have hecklers in it. And that's okay. You're, you're not alone. <laughs> uh, no one understands them yet, but they all will. You don't have to stick your head in the sand. They'll keep it simple. The seller is simply financing the deal. Every bit is safe, even safer than a trans traditional loan. There are five times more people who can buy using these options versus traditional mortgages. These are tools for deal engineers. Real estate agents are deal engineers. You're not ever deceiving anyone. You sh shouldn't be anyways. You should be solving people's problems and mitigating their risk. That's what we do. People who don't understand something say alternative purchase options are monkey, Mickey Mouse or dangerous, not legal. Or it's just because it's different. <laughs> anyway, so anybody got any questions? Uh, that's really all I'm going to do. There's a lot more to this workshop, but I probably went on longer than my gracious host wanted me to go on. So uh, any other questions that anybody has? Um, yeah, maybe if you could, there you go, stop sharing, and then we can uh, open it up for questions to uh, to anybody who wants to ask. Um, Dennis put in the chat, how do you find sellers that are not in the MLS who would do these deals? You want me to answer that or are you? Sure, go ahead. Well, you could probably answer that just as easy as I am. Uh, any expired listing is, they couldn't get enough for the house. Expired not, listings, uh, houses that are in the beginning stages of, uh, of um, default. Yeah. Um, but in most cases, when you're calling on an expired listing, you're another agent trying to do the same thing that the last agent did. Right. But here you're going to be coming with a completely different story. Oh, you need to make four hundred and eighty thousand, and it's only it'll only appraise for four fifty. No problem. I'll get you four eighty. Right. And you so, can almost guarantee it if they've got yeah. a three and a half percent interest rate on their underlying loan. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, a, a, an agent who fully understands. Uh, this process could, you know, sit on a on an auto dialer to expireds every morning and probably have very good conversations with alternatives that every other agent that's been calling them has not brought up. Now let me let me say something. I want everybody to understand. There's only one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. There's a, a very short, very small group on here. Yeah, we have like 13. Yeah. And I know a couple of them. And I'm I'm always happy to help you. I would be crazy as a mortgage lender not to want to build a relationship with any one of you. Thank you very much. So you can always call me on this. But have you ever heard of a real estate agent offering to buy their client's house if it doesn't sell at the price they want? I mean, that's pretty rare, right? I know the top agent in Temecula, they do that. They'll buy the house if they, if they can't get what the seller wants. And why? In the, how in the world can they do that? How can they promise that? Seller financing. Seller yeah. financing. Yeah, I'll buy it from you. We'll change title. We're going to do an all-inclusive trust deed. I'll hold on to it. I'll rent it out. With your underlying loan payment, I can rent it out, make enough money on it. And when, when it's worth it, I'll, I'll, I'll resell it. I mean, that's what they're doing in many, many cases. It's very exciting to understand. Not necessarily something you might want to do, but it's exciting to understand how these guys do stuff like that. Yep. Yeah, a lot of times, you know, you'll look at um, uh, a property that has been rented for a long time, and sometimes you'll see for sale by owner and for for lease by owner at the same time, right? So that owner is trying to sell the property or lease the property again themselves without using an agent. As an agent, I, I want to talk to them, right? If I was an agent, I would want to talk to them because oh, yeah. that could go both ways, right? It could be you obviously are trying to lease it. You also are interested in selling it. Yeah, I'm, I'm just tired of dealing with, you know, the tenants and this and that. This house has been this. This house has been that. This neighborhood's been that. Whatever it's been, right? Uh, but they don't want to sit empty pocketed for a long time. So they're willing to do whatever comes first. You know, you may be able to, to find a way where you can continue to put money in the seller's, in the, in the seller, the owner, current owner's pocket and help out a buyer get a get a pretty good you know deal on it getting into that property so you know and not only that is you may be able to at worst case scenario help him find another investment property somewhere else right or or at least build a relationship with somebody like steve's trying to do with you all right and tell me you 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 got this down pat completely and that's exciting i'll tell you 
when you know somebody and when you know a listing agent understands this you'll see that they they'll put their sign out in front of a house just like they normally do but they'll also put another sign that says seller financing no bank needed and right. their phone number again there cuz that's yeah. going to create a lot of people calling cuz now you know 85% more people can buy that house and uh, you're communicating with different people and you're going to find other buyers and other sellers and all kinds. Well, how are you doing that? You're going to have conversations that you never thought you'd have. Exactly. Yeah, it's, um, you know, it, it's, you're going to have to do some research to find these deals. You're going to have to do some research to build relationships, things like that. But it is extremely, um, it's not, it's not difficult at all to, you know, do a little research and, and find uh, sellers that are willing to do a seller carry or to do a wrap or to try and get out of a situation without losing. Bottom right. line is if somebody is in foreclosure and they're 20 grand upside down and you could come in with, you know, 30 grand as a down payment, 20 to pay off their debt and 10 in their pocket and do a wrap around and get them out of the thing so that it doesn't affect their credit and they can move forward with, with life. Um, it's a win-win. So there's numerous ways of finding these deals. There's, there's no one way, right? And um, so there was a question in the chat, you know, what escrow companies? Yes, escrow spectrum with Mary Jane Morris, who's my counterpart on these Zooms can handle these deals. Um, I'm the area sales manager for California Title. We do these deals all the time. Um, so, you know, again, if you need help trying to come up with, uh, ways of marketing, ways of uh, finding those deals, et cetera. My number is in the chat. By all means, give me a call. I'd love to sit with you. I know Steve has been very accessible and um, and he's a book of knowledge. So, um, and I don't want to talk for you, Steve, but you did mention on our previous Zoom that, you know, you, you are willing to answer questions as long as you're not asking him to handle deals or make decisions. He'll answer some questions for you, but please don't bombard Steve with 45 minutes of a question. Come prepared to ask him a question, and I'm sure he'll give you a straightforward answer, but don't waste Steve's time, please. And I, and I have been known to um, be involved with explaining this to the seller and the buyer some, in some cases, although I'd much rather come from you because it needs to come from you. But in the first, first one or two deals, if you... If you want me to get involved, I would charge 1% for that. And I don't get paid unless the transaction closes. But that's just me explaining the pros and cons and the, and the ways to be to to mitigate uh, uh, any concerns to both the buyer and the seller and maybe helping you, you know, put the, put together a deal. Uh, I will be willing to do that. I'm also willing to help uh, agents with their marketing. Um, I have the whole marketing plans put together. Um, I don't do coaching necessarily, but on an individual basis, if somebody has some questions about marketing, how to get started, how to get some more business coming in the door, I, I'd be happy to help you with that. You know, and, that's, and that's awesome because I've never, ever heard anybody who understands um, seller financing to offer his services even for 1%. Most are not willing. They'll give you information, but they want you to figure it out, right? So for right. you to find a deal, uh, especially as an agent and put a deal together and there's not another agent attached to it and you know, you could go in at three, three and a half percent on that deal and then offer Steve a percent to help you through that first deal. Oh my gosh, that's like something just fell from the skies and landed in your lap. And it doesn't have to be paid by the commission, the, by the uh, agent. It can be paid by the buyer yeah if the buyer knows what he's doing he wants the seller to take the deal he'd be happy to pay somebody one sure. percent to help help the seller understand why it's not dangerous for him right and the seller can pay it the buyer can pay it anybody can pay it i have a lot of agents i work with that do uh creative financing seller financing deals for themselves for investments uh for flips for for different uh different scenarios and again there's there's many different avenues here. If you missed the first two weeks of this, again, in the chat, I put the recordings to those. So you could go back, uh, view those those uh, first two weeks that we had Steve on talking about lease options and uh, creative financing in different ways. Guys, this is just another pillar 
for you agents that are out there. This is just another pillar for you, right? Um, it's another avenue of expanding your business to another market that ultimately, to be honest, a lot of these would be buyers that you would probably shut the door on because they're just not qualified, right? Whether it's a FICO uh, issue, but they have plenty of income coming in, or it is um, they're self-employed and they don't claim enough to qualify for enough. And if you know they don't have the down payment to put 10, 15% down, there's different scenarios for these buyers of why they're not buying, okay? And um, these are great to try and find seller financing options for. So I'm putting, um, my, I'm putting my email in the chat box. I'm also putting the, uh, uh, the uh, location of the, uh, uh, the YouTube channel for a subscription. If you want to subscribe, you'll get my weekly uh, one bite at a time show, which is mm -hmm. designed to give agents three to five minute video every week about something that's important in this market today that'll help you uh, yeah. little bites at a time. How do you? Yeah, I subscribed. Oh, thank you very much. And Tommy, you are in title, right? I am. Okay. What title company do you represent? California title. Oh, okay, good. I guess I didn't know that. I thought you were a broker, real estate nope. broker. No, nope. area sales manager for California title. Well, I'd love to talk to you off camera sometime, just have a conversation. Absolutely. My contact is in the chat as well, uh, right above yours. And guys, I want to thank you. Is, is there any more questions for Steve before we kind of stop the Zoom for today? And, um, you know, I'll hang out online. I'm usually last to leave. And uh, if Steve can hang out, we can ask answer any uh, uh, questions offline. Um, but yes, Dennis, to answer your question, yes, I can do these deals from a title perspective. Uh, Mary Jane can do them from an escrow perspective. So you're taking care of on that. Um, and I'm that's sure a big that deal because a lot of companies aren't yet doing them. They will be, but they're not yet doing them yet. So um, yeah, again, I can answer uh, any questions you have. I can I can help you with the marketing side of it and in sourcing those deals. By all means, feel free to give me a call. Uh, my email, my cell phone, my website were all in the chat. And um, uh, Steve, I want to thank you for taking three weeks of your time, uh, hour and a half each, to drop knowledge on us because uh, I learned a lot and I thought I knew quite a bit uh, about seller financing. And not a single week went by that I didn't learn something. So, um, you know, guys, I hope hope you did. Please jot down Steve's uh, name, his email that's in the chat. And um, and if you have questions moving forward in regards to seller financing, use him as a resource. But by all means, build a relationship with him. He is a mortgage uh, broker. So, you know, he, he is he's looking to build relationships with you guys as well to help you on your traditional uh, mortgages for your clients. Thanks. Well. And real, real quick, I, I, I want to say, if you haven't watched the lease option portion, uh, you need to do that first and then email me and I'll send you the links for the entire program all for free. But if you don't watch the lease option first and you start bouncing around in there, you, you, you could become confused. And what does a confused mind say? I don't want to do it. Right. All right, guys, again, thank you for your time. Uh, we're here every week on Monday, except for holiday weeks. Uh, same Zoom link, same time every week. We look forward to seeing you back with us. We try and give you as much uh, uh, knowledge and as much uh, value as possible. So um, if we could be of any service, please, please uh, feel free to reach out to us. Thank hey guys, you guys. Have a great day. I got to run.